morning. Sing your troubles away. Number 363 at Calvary. Number 363. Remind you this morning the choir has a special here after a while. Page number 363 at Calvary this morning. Come and help us sing this morning. Be a part of it today. Number 363. Number 363. First verse. Years of spin and vanity and pride. Caring of the Lord is crucified. Knowing not it was for me. you have that blessed assurance number 463 number 463 number 463 blessed assurance Jesus is mine
And number 473 is returning there. We'll take care of some birthdays. And a few anniversaries this morning. Page number 473, Heavenly Sunlight. All right, birthdays. My goodness, our list was a little long last week and a little shorter this week. But have you ever noticed that you have to get old before anybody will say you look awfully young? Amen. Well, that's the way to go, isn't it? We have uh, Mac Tate here on the 3rd today. Happy birthday to Mac. We have Dawson Maynards on the 7th. Anna Rice on the 7th. We have Megan Lakey on the 7th. And she's getting married here pretty soon, folks. So remember her. Amen. Also remember Kathy Coop. She has a birthday on the 8th. And Christine Glidden on the 8th. Ben Kelly on the 9th. Baron Helfridge on the 9th. And Zachary Waltice on the 9th. All right. Well, that's all we have is birthdays for this week. Let's sing to these folks today. Happy anniversary to you. To Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you the whole year through. Dean, you're up. How many years? 70? 41. 41. How many? 24. Oh, 24. I thought you said 44. Okay. Good. All right. Well, Dean and Raylene, we wish you a happy anniversary. And Don and Sheila, we wish you all a happy anniversary. So let's sing to these couples today, all right? Happy anniversary to you. To Jesus be true. God bless you and keep you. This coming week, September the 7th at 5.30, it will be a baby shower for Courtney uh, Jones and baby girl. And they're registered at Walmart and at Target. Remind you, on September the 16th, we'll have a camp cleanup day down at Camp Joy to get ready for the fall retreat. We appreciate any help there. On the 17th, the next, that Sunday after, the 17th is Daughter's Day. And then on September the 29th through October the 1st is the camp meeting here. Be in much prayer for that. And uh, I'm sure there will be a test after all these announcements to see if you listened very good today. Uh, October the 12th through the 14th, we'll be having our college and high school retreat down at camp. And then October the 13th, Brady and Megan will be getting married. And, uh, they're, and if you can, please uh, RSVP with a number that's listed there. And they're registered, registered at the knot.com. Registered at the knot.com. All right, that's all the announcements I have uh, this morning. Pastor, I'm sure, has some later on. But let's stand this morning if you're able and let's sing Heavenly Sunlight, number 473 today. Walking in sunlight all of my journey. Walking in sunlight. Oh uh -huh. 
church today and be a blessing to one another today. Catherine, Danny's going to lead us in Bible reading this morning. Danny, what uh, chapter? Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. Let's stand together as we read God's Word together. And then there'll be a special right after that. Correct? All right, Romans chapter 13 this morning. Let's read responsively through this chapter. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are that be are ordained of God. Therefore, 
For rulers are not, not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Thank you. You may be seated.
Lord, I'll take that any time. Amen. Amen. Hey, I want to tell you also, that's a good job. That's a good job. Boy, I tell you, didn't that minister to your heart? Amen. Minister to your spirit and your soul. Amen. Take your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. I want to say we're thrilled with everybody that's here today. I tell you, I want you to know the Lord loves you with an everlasting love. You can go to hell unsaved and you will, but you'll not go to hell unloved. You'll not go to hell unloved. Genesis chapter 14 today. Now listen, uh, we had something exciting happen last night. There's a new baby boy. The Atchison family had a new baby boy last night. They're not here, but all the kids are here. They come walking in this morning. But uh, anyway, we'll see that new baby here maybe next week, you reckon? But they've got a brand new baby boy that uh, was born last night. Uh, listen, uh, two weeks from today is Daughter of the King Day. We're going to have a special day for the young ladies of this church. It's going to be exciting. And I'm talking about from little bitty in your arms girls to girls 35, 40 years old. I don't care. And, uh, and uh, well, we have daughters. But what's going to happen is I'm going to preach a message on being a daughter of the king. We're going to honor and encourage young ladies in this church. Amen. And I encourage you to invite people to come. But it's going to be, I want it to be a special day. We're going to have flowers for you girls. They're going to pin flowers on every one of you. If you'll let them. And uh, we're going to have a gift for all the girls. And then after service, uh, we're having a meal down here in, in our place back yonder. I don't know what you got figured out, but they're going to have a beautiful, wonderful meal. And the boys and all the young men and the brothers are going to serve. All, and by the way, everybody in church is invited down to the banquet, okay? Everybody. But we're going to have special seating for the parents and, with their daughters. And you boys don't get to sit to That's just, that's their day. And, but the boys are going to be serving and waiting, and the boys are all going to wear <clears throat> bow ties. Uh, let me just put it this way. Let's just, just try ties, okay? But I'd like for all you boys to have a white shirt and a tie on. I don't care if you got uh, camouflage britches on, but I would like to have a white shirt and a tie. And I'd like to kind of be decked out, and I want you to be, I mean, at your sister's beck and call. If she says, I want more water, you run and get her more water. Amen. And you be a blessing to her. And uh, so we're going to do that. But that'll be a banquet down here right after church. I mean, we're going to run right down there and have this banquet. Yes, Brother Tim. I'd like to thank everybody that prayed for my dad over the weekend. Uh, he went into the hospital and the doctors told him he was going to lose his foot. Uh, he had zero circulation in his foot. Uh, and we put it out on the prayer chain and had a lot of people praying. And the doctor still cannot explain it, but he got circulation back in his foot. He was able to feel it. Uh, he got up walking around Friday when the doctor told him he couldn't. Uh, he was able to get up and walk around, and he told the doctor, I'm leaving tomorrow. The doctor said, that ain't happening. We left yesterday morning. <laughs> That's a blessing, isn't it, Tim? It's, and so I say it's good for your children to see God answer prayer. You mark that, you write that down somewhere in a journal. But anyway, then young men also, I would like for you young, hello, Philip. Good to see you back there. You and your wife and family. Did, did we ever, did you ever show your baby to this church? Did I ever have you do that? Would you just show, I mean, you, I don't get to see, he, that boy grew up in church. You want to do it, bother him? Okay, we won't bother him. <laughs> but let, him, let, him let him have church in peace, huh? All righty. But then we want you young men to sing to your sisters. So I want you young men to get a song together that you can sing to all the girls. Amen. And uh, you look at them real sweet and smile like you love them. Amen. And then uh, we'll be talking more about that. Later. Listen, pray for Sister Connie Dodge as Tim's dad. Uh, Tim, and then pray for Tim uh, uh, friend as he continues to heal up. But pray for Sister Connie. She's doing better today. And as I said, daughter Sunday on the 17th. And uh, then September 29th, 30th, October, we're going to have that fall jubilee and it'll be more about that. But I'm just going to say this briefly. I did not know when I set that date that that's the same day, the 30th, as the Norwood Farmers, Mark, Norwood Farmers Day. And there's going to be a crowd here in town. I mean, a huge crowd. So, and while I'm thinking about that, uh, Tobias, where you at? Tobias, right over yonder. This young man is praying for 70 people. For God to give him 70 people to help in the town house to house visitation. They're working Marshfield right now. If you'd like to be one of those 70, that maybe once a month, maybe one Saturday a month, you would go with him. 
and uh, help work house to house. But I think that's a pretty good vision for a young man to have. As far as I'm concerned, it's probably one of the largest and best evangelistic efforts there is out there. And going house to house, taking it to people, just like God said to do. But if you're possibly interested, we'll talk more about that yesterday. But it could be at Farmer's Day here that if we could, might have a team go out and give Gospel of John and Romans throughout the town that day. God may have brought them all in for us for that. All excited. All right. I can see some of you. Anyway, let's go to, let's get at it. Amen. Genesis chapter uh, 14 this morning was a journey through Genesis. And uh, I want to preach today a message entitled, Who's Going to Be Your King? Genesis chapter 14. Let's begin reading at verse number one now. Uh, chapter, four, chapter 13 is where you have the, the deal about Sodom a lot, where Lot goes towards Sodom. Number 13 is number of rebellion. Number 14 is the number of deliverance. And it's in this chapter that Lot is delivered by Abraham after having been taken captive. Let's begin reading verse number 1. Came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now some of these guys' names I may not get right. Ariok, king of Elisar, Shedolamir, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom, with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemaber, king of Zeboim, king of Bela, which is Zoar. All these were joined together in the Vale of Sidon, which is the Salt Sea. By the way, that's right down to the Dead Sea. That tells you where Sodom and Gomorrah was in Bible days, okay? Verse number four, 12 years they served Shedelamar, and in the 13th year, look at that, 13th year, they rebelled. 13 is the number of rebellion. In the Bible is the number of rebellion in nature. And number, verse number five, and in the 14th year came Shedelamar with the kings that were with him and smote the Rephims at Ashtaroth, Carnaim, and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims in Shava, Kera, Pham. And the Horites went in their Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they returned and came to Ishmipat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazon, Tamar. And they went out of the king of Sodom, and the king of Gomorrah, and the king of Adma, and the king of Zeboam, and the king of Bela, which the same as Zoar. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. With Shedelamar, king of Elam, with Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, four kings with five. Now I'm just going to point out to you that at this point you have nine kings. But before the chapter's over, there's going to be ten kings. I want to tell you that in the book of Daniel, he speaks about ten kings. This is a prophet. There's, God always writes on several layers. But you come down to verse number 10, the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits. That's down that uh, Sodomite country. And that, that's uh, interesting, isn't it? Slime pits. And the king of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there, and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. And I believe if it hadn't been for the next statement in verse number 12, this would probably not have been in the Bible, but it is. And they took Lot. Now Lot was Abraham's nephew that had left him and pitched his tent toward Sodom. He's down in Sodom now. And it said they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol, the brother of Anar, and these were confederate with Abram. Now watch verse 14 and chapter 14, the number of deliverance. When Abram heard that his brother, he still called Lot his brother because he was his brother. Let me just tell you something. Just because you and a Christian somewhere are not in good, sweet fellowship does not mean he ceased to be your brother. And Abram here is a great man who recognized that all the lots not where he ought to be. He's still my brother in Christ. And when he had the opportunity, he went and rescued him. When Abram heard that his brother Lot was taken, he armed, uh, armed, uh, uh, armed. The Bible teaches being armed. These people that's against the second amendment don't know nothing. They don't know why they're even on this earth. That Abram is a father of faith and he was armed. Did you hear me? I promise you that if it had AK-47s his day, he'd have had a truck full of them. <laughs> then it says his trained servants, they knew how to use these arms. Born in his own house, 318 pursued them to Dan. Oh, Abram, he loaded up the Calvary, got all the weapons out, and took after these kings that had, uh, had kidnapped his nephew Lot, and he goes after them. Now, verse number 15, 
is one of the greatest battle war verses in the Bible teaching warfare. It is still used to this day to conquer in war. He divided himself. He took these 318 men, put them into two different battle groups. One went one way, one went the other. It's called a pincer movement. You ever heard that in warfare? It's called a pincer movement. And he also did it at night. Most people are not wanting, you know, they're kind of like, a, and one of the greatest battles, they always hit at night, hit when they're not thinking, hit when they're tired, hit when they're sleepy, with a pincer movement. These are just tactics that generals in American history have used in warfare. Now he said there in verse number 15, divided himself against them as servants by night, smote them, pursued them to Hoboth, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Now watch verse 16. He brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot. He got him. And his goods and the women also and the people. I think they had a pretty good smashing success battle, don't you? Amen. I think he won that thing. Now, he's come back. Now I want you to see what happens. Now Abram is a father of faith. Everything that goes on in his life, you're going to watch it real careful. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Shedelamar with the kings that were with him in the valley of Shava, which is in the king's dale. And here's another king, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed the Most High God, which hath, be, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. That tells you that in the book of Hebrews. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, write this in your Bible. Here's what he wants. Give me the persons and take the goods to yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, a thread, even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say I have made Abram rich, save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which you went with me, Abner, Esco, Memory, and let them take their portion. He said, the soldiers can take some of the spoils, but I don't want anything you got to offer. Lord, help me to preach quick and fast, and in the power and unction of the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, amen. As I said earlier, this is the first mention of kings in the Bible, and it's the first mention of war in the Bible. First time you ever read about a king of any kind, and the first time we read about a war of any time. When you're looking at the Bible, you have there's a principle called the law of first mention. And what a law of first mention does is lays down the foundation of wisdom for the rest of the Bible in an understanding in that subject. So here we learn a great principle about spiritual life and physical life in that Abram is walking up to and he is confronted with two kings. Everybody in this building, everybody in this planet is confronted by two kings in your life. Now you're going to be confronted by it personally in your own heart and life. You're going to be confronted by it oftentimes in your family life, your church life, and in your nation. Let me say something to you this morning. You will choose a king. You will choose a king. And uh, for your life. You are never your own ruler. You are never your own leader. Somebody says, I do my own thing. No, you don't. You're either doing God's thing or the devil's thing. Right now you're doing that. Every day of your life, you're either doing God's thing or the devil's thing. Anytime, now here's one of the major principles to this message. Anytime there's more than one king in your life, there's going to be war in your heart and your mind. Get that. You don't want to get anything else here today. Anytime you're trying to serve two kings at the same time, it's going to create a chaotic warfare situation within your heart and with your mind. You will have already or you will someday choose a king. Young people, listen to me. Maybe your daddy has already chose his king. Maybe your mother has already chose their king. I hope they have and I hope they made the right choice. But you're facing this. You're walking down the road of life. You're coming maybe here to church Sunday after Sunday. And yet you may have been here for years, but you've not yet chosen who's really going to be the ultimate and final king of your life. Jesus said, Matthew 6, 24, that no man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Watch what he said. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. People believe that they can serve the Lord and the world. God says you can't. Amen. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. He says, no man can serve two masters. This principle is given throughout all the Bible. Joshua 24, 15 said this, Choose you this day whom ye will serve. 
Moses, the Bible said, chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah said this to the people. Watch this carefully. How long halt ye between two opinions? Well, why did he ask that question? What did Elijah say to all of Israel? How long halt you between two opinions? Because they were trying to serve two gods and God will not allow it. Amen. They wanted to serve Baal and they wanted to serve God. They wanted to love the world and they wanted to love God. And Jesus said, you cannot do this. I will be king or I will not be anything to you at all. Now, I'll be your judge. So when Moses said that, then we come down in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. Listen to what our Lord Jesus Christ says. He that is not with me is against me. Yeah. Did you get that? Yeah. Jesus, the one we said we came to worship here today, said this. If you say, if you're, he, he that is not with me is against me. And he said, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. James 4, 4 says, no, you're not. He said, don't you know this? That friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You get that? You can't be a friend of the world and be a friend of God. God will not allow it. Amen. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 10, watch this verse. You should not have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and drink the cup of devils. Now you say, well, that's a nice Bible verse. What does that mean for you practically? What does that mean for you when you walk out of this church house? What does that mean for you how you're living your life? God says you can't do it. You may think you can, but you can't. The Bible said you cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. It's telling you that the devil has a cup, the devil has a table, and the devil has fellowship. And God said, if you've got fellowship with him, if you're drinking from his cup, if you're eating at his table, you are not eating in mine. You're not eating in mine. The spiritual disease that is killing America today is not necessarily Washington, D.C. per se. It is the indecisiveness, the duplicity, the duality, and the syncretism of American churches and Christianity. It is a worship bell on one side of my life and worship Jesus on the other. The Bible calls it double-mindedness. And a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You cannot live in the world and live in a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing, Christ-honoring, God-glorifying church. There is a principle of victory and success that God gives. You obey him first, surrender to him first, and then you understand later, if not in eternity. If I were to analyze your life today, and if you were to analyze your life and be honest about it today, who is your king? The king of Sodom? Isn't it interesting that it was the king of Sodom who came out to meet Abraham? By the way, he came out first. And the king of Sodom, isn't it, who will be your king? Who will you give the flower of your life? Just being here today does not necessarily mean that Jesus Christ is your king. Abraham, the father of those who live by faith, experienced this. And you and I will experience the same trials that Abraham experienced to some degree. God will bring each of us to a place of our choice. Not just in a shallow mouth profession, but in a practical reality and experience of life. Who will be my real and ultimate king? The people, this people, the Bible said in the book of Isaiah, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So first of all, we see that two kings came out. Now it's interesting that they came out into the king's dale at a place called S-H-A-V-E-A, -E Shava. The king's dale can be typified as your heart. Did you know that your heart, your spirit, your soul is the king's dale? Somebody is going to sit on the throne in the king's dale in your heart. The place of Shava, though, is this. Watch this. That blew, this blew me away. Shava means to and fro. To and fro. Shava means duality. They were running over here trying to live a church life. Running over here, living the world life. Running to and fro, living back in the world and do it that, having a cup with the world. Running over here, having a cup with God. And the Bible says, literally, that they were going back and forth. It means over here and then over there. Over there and then over here. A duality, a double life. 
I want you to look first of all with me this morning, number one, at the identification of these kings. In verse number 17 and 18, you'll see of the king of Sodom. You say, Reggie, who is that? I don't think it takes much spirituality or theological examination to know who he represents. Who does he represent? Somebody tell me. The devil. He represents the devil. By the way, the devil is called in Revelation the king that comes out, Apollyon, who comes out of the heart of the earth with the beast out of there. He is a king over the devils of this earth. He is the god of this world. The Bible calls his name Lucifer, which is the light bearer. He is called an angel of light. He is called a tempter and an enticer. He is called Apollyon, one that destroys. He is called a deceiver. He is called Belial. And that means vile and ruthless. He is called the God of this world, little g. He's called the prince of the power of the air. And he came out, he strutted right out and walked up to Abraham. And he made him an offer. Now you listen to me. You say, who is this? We're talking about the king of Sodom represents Satan. And by the way, Satan is going to and fro throughout the whole earth, the Bible says, seeking whom he may devour. He came up to Abram and he made a pitch to devour Abraham's life. And if Abraham had made the wrong choice, you'd have never heard about him except right here in the game would have been over with Abraham's life. You say, Reggie, what is the creed of this crud king of Sodom, the king of slime pits? What part of his creed is this? The end justifies the means. That's what America believes about anything now. Help me tell you what he wants you to have approval of the world, the acceptance of the world. His theme is eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If there's nothing after life, you just die and go back to the dirt. He's a liar and the father of it. This crud king will tell you sin will not find you out, but your Bible says it will. This liar will tell you to serve your flesh. If it feels good, do it. He wants you to go after all the pleasure and all the wealth of this world. Did you know the Bible said that she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth? If all you're seeking after is pleasure, God says, I can tell you something about yourself. You are dead already and don't know it. He'll, he, the devil wants you to live for now and live for yourself. He wants you to take, take it. I'm going to say this. I want to ask some questions today. And I want you to tell me who's the king of the situation. In the lotto business. Who's king of lotto? Come on. We come in here for a Sunday school picnic. We're here for business. There's families going to go to heaven or hell. There's people going to go to heaven or hell here today. There's entire eternity in front of you. Who is the king of the gambling business? The devil, the king of Sodom. Who is the king of the casinos that you see going all out through there? Who's king of that? The devil. Well, I can tell you right now, it ain't Jesus Christ. He ain't king of that garbage, amen? Who is the king of the liquor industry? Yeah. So who's, who are you serving? Who's your king? I want to ask you this. Who's the king of the drug industry? Who's the king of the vaping industry? Who's the king of pot? Yeah. Who's the king of immodesty? I would tell you something straight up, gun barrel straight. Now you listen to me. I've been, been I didn't come in as old Ronnie Simmons said on the last load of pumpkins. I've been a lot, I get a lot of contact from preachers across America. And I want to tell you something today. You know why most of them are sick of it and discouraged? They just want to quit. Because if they get up and preach on immodesty and nakedness in our churches, half their congregations will leave. And it's like, Reggie, I can't preach on until all leave. Well, I want to tell you something this morning. I love you. I love you so much. I'm not quitting preaching on it. I want to tell you bikini girls something. Are you listening to me? You bikini girls. You know who I'm talking to. You're dressing in your underwear in public. You're dressing in your underwear in public. It is wicked. It is nakedness. It is nasty. It's filthy. Then you want to prance into church here and play your deal, but you're going to drink the cup of the devils while you're out there wearing your little bikini? I love you enough. You know what your problem is? You, do, you, do, you want to live a double life. You want to serve two kings. I'm telling you, at judgment day, you will not serve two kings. You don't need to be the king of Sodom. I want to ask you something. Who's the king in the bikini crowd? Do you think Jesus is the king of that? I want to ask you, who's the king of these shorts up to your rear end? Is Jesus the king of that, brother? Who's the king of it? 
Who's the king of this wearing stuff down girls to you? See your, almost see your, all about half your breast. Yeah. Who's your king? Who's your king? Why don't you get honest one day in your life and admit who is your king? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, tell you something, listen to me. Do I like people? I love people. I sure wouldn't be in the preaching uh, uh, calling if I didn't love people. I promise you that. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to stand at judgment day and you look at me and say, you little wimp preacher, why wouldn't you preach the truth to me? You know what the problem is? This country got a bunch of wimpy, coward preachers. They're afraid to preach anything because they're afraid that people will leave. They're afraid the money will dry up. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I want to ask you another thing. Who's the, who's the king of immorality? Jesus. Who's the king of fornication? Jesus or the devil? Yeah. Who's the king of adultery? Yeah. Let me just tell you something. About, I got a message I'm working on called hypocrisy and I'll preach some of it right now. You know why the queers has got such a hold on this country? Because we're hypocrites. Amen. See, we're selective in our immorality. Yeah. It's just fine for us to divorce. It's just fine for us to commit fornication. It's just fine for us to commit adultery. But oh, if you're a queer, you're a nasty, filthy. Come on. It's all immorality. It's all immorality. Them queers. But you watch that pornography. Come on. Yeah. You talk about a slime. There's a reason the Holy Ghost says that all this went on down in the slime pit. Because that's a slime pit. Let me ask you. Who's the king of country and western music? Jesus or the devil? Who's the king of NASCAR beer throwing down the tailgate party in that NASCAR? Drinking your queer Bud Light. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, God just cares about you. He don't want you living in the seat all your life. He don't want you busting hell wide open and saying, nobody told me. Yeah. Who is the king of rock and roll? Yeah, it ain't Elvis Presley. No. You won't tell you, I don't tell you what the devil did with you. Elvis Presley was nearly worshipped and still is worshipped by most of these 70 and 80 year old wannabe young girl. Uh, I better, better be careful. <laughs> Elvis Presley was called the king of rock and roll. Do you know where he died? On his knees between the wall and his bed. Set up with rigor mortis. How many knows what rigor mortis or whatever that is? Rigor mortis. Body locked up. Laying like this on his bed. And his body full of drugs. Hey king. Hey king. No, the real truth was he wasn't king of nothing. The devil was his king. And the devil, the king that suck of Sodom, always destroys his worshipers. Marilyn Monroe was queen of beauty. She was queen of sex. She was queen of porn. She was queen of this and that and the other. How did Marilyn Monroe die? You tell me. She overdosed. She sold her body naked to Playboy magazine for a million bucks, buddy. Back in those days, that was huge money. Do you know what she did? She wrote a note, put it on her bed, swallowed a bottle full of pills, died in her own vomit. And the, you know what the note said? It wasn't worth it. That's where Satan will take you. You think you're following a king that's really going to take you places. How dumb are you? How ignorant are you saying you shouldn't talk to me like that? Well, I'll tell you, it's stupid to follow the devil. Yeah. And Abram knew that clown wasn't taking him anywhere except to destruction. Yeah. Wake up. You know what God does every once in a while? He'll send an old hellfire brimstone Bible believing preacher like me along just to wake you up a little bit and make you mad. So you're driving home saying, I'll never go back there again. Yeah. But you ain't never going to forget it. Amen. You know why I know that? Because the Holy Ghost. Well, honor his word. Yes, I'm telling you right. You can run from mom and daddy. You can run from the preacher. But you can't run from the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Well, listen to me. Who is, the, who is the king of rap? That stuff makes me want to vomit. I, some car goes by and that's little. Bleh. And this ooh, contemporary Christian music. Boy, that's a good looking boy. She's a beauty. I don't know what her name is. Oh, I worship Jesus. Boy, he's a fancy looking dude. Yeah, yeah. Hey, 
Some of you are going, some of you are going down to them places you're exercising. No, you're not. You're going looking for somebody. I don't care, married or unmarried. Hey, you can take care of smoking your pipe, amen. If you really wanted to lose weight, buy you a push lawnmower. Amen. Yeah, chainsaw. No, you ain't interested in losing weight. You won't go down there. Oh, man. I'm going to go down and get on this machine, get on this machine, get a little closer to him. Maybe he'll see me in my bikini. Who's king of that garbage? Come on, be honest. The devil is the king of it. Who is the king of the sodomite, transgender, child molesting crowd? It sure ain't God Almighty, I can promise you that. But that's who you're following. Oh, you and your little king of Sodom, you're following that crowd. Hey, can I tell you something? You watching that stinking pornography? Did you know who really runs and owns that stuff? The queers. The queers. So every time you're watching your porn, you're just going, num, 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 licking up the queer slop, vomit. Satan vomits out of hell and you lick it up. Who is the king of public schools? Is Jesus Christ king of public education in America? No there ain't no way in this stinking world. If you to say so, it's just a self-deception to a brand new level. 26% come out this week. 26% of the eighth graders in America in public education system cannot read, cannot do math to a proficient level. 26% can't do it. You ought to read. That is, that's the tip of the iceberg. And it's not about education anymore. Boy, out in Colorado this week, wore a backpack in there, had the Gadsden flag on it. You know the don't tread on me flag? Teacher pulls him in, says, you ain't wearing that in this school. They got their BLM backpacks. They got all their other stuff, Antifa backpacks. They got everything else. He says, why can't I wear mine? You just can't. Yeah. But you know what? His mom and daddy went to bat for him. First thing they should do is jerk him out of that hell hole. But they went to bat for him. And I think the school wound up paying him $100,000 over the stinking deal. And I was glad for it. And your tax wearer's work money is at work. Who's the, who is the king of sports world in America? How, you say, well, oh yeah, sports illustrated? Yeah. You tell me what's on the front of Sports Illustrated. Huh? Half naked woman. Who's the king of that? You see, what you need to do is cut the dice this morning. You need to cut her right down the middle and say what is of God and what is not of God and quit playing your stupid, hypocritical, nonsense game that's going to get found out in judgment anyway. Oh, you think you're religious because you said something when you was a kid. You got baptized. You repeated a prayer after somebody. But you live like the world. Let me just tell you something. I didn't come in on the last load of uh, uh, wood. Before I got saved, Brother Glidden, on January 24th, 1982, I'll tell you what I was doing. I was walking in church on Sunday morning. Hey, I'm telling you what I was doing on Saturday night. I was living in two worlds. And I'm going to tell you something. I know what I'm talking about. When God saved me, when the new birth came, yes. I'm not talking about saying a catechism. Yeah. I'm not talking about getting sprinkled. I'm talking about when the Holy Ghost does the work of conviction in your heart, tells you you're a sinner, you're headed to hell, you're guilty, you broke the laws of God, and you realize, Lord, I'm, I'm in trouble. God, have mercy upon me. And that's when God will save you. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, why do you think he died on the cross? Why do you think he shed his blood? Why do you think he wore the crown of thorns? Why do you think he let them spit on him? To save you from your sin. Amen. To save you not in your sin, from your sin. Amen. 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 There'll never be a salvation in this country as long as the church is as weak as it is right now. I could go on down the road. Who's king of the Democrat Party? I'll blow your hat off. Sure ain't Jesus Christ. Now I ain't saying he's the king of the Republican Party. But I got one thing figured out for sure. He ain't king of the Democrat Party. We're in Nazi land if you don't know it. Amen. All these charges against Trump, that ain't bad. All he did was contest the election. And if it's to where we can't contest elections in this country, we don't have freedom no longer. Amen. I'm not a Trump fan. 
I'm not blowing him up to you, but I'm just saying, listen here. He sure be what we got now, amen. Anyway, I don't want to get off on all that stupid stuff. I lost some of you about 50 yards back on the line anyway. <laughs> Satan is so deceitful. This king of Sodom is so deceitful, he'll make you think you're saved. While there's no fruit of repentance in your life. No obedience. You think you're golden corral with you where you can pick and choose what you want to do God, God's word says. And the real problem is there's not some kind of law, law, law. No, the real problem is there's never been a new birth down inside here that makes you love the Lord and say, you know what? Some, the, the statutes of the Lord are good and right. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And Lord, you saved me. You made a new creation. And I love you, God. And I want to obey you. And I want to do right. And I know you never do nothing to me that would be harmful for my best interest. And God, I'll say what I love, I want to serve you. I want to love you enough to do right. Amen. The greatest sin you'll ever commit is not loving God. Amen. I get up here all day and preach on that sin, this sin, the other sin. But the bottom line is this, is that you love this world and love yourself and you love your sin and you don't love God. That's why the first commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, all thy mind and with all thy strength. All the rest of it, he said, hangs yeah. on that one right there. Amen. This king of Sodom, he's clever. He's deceitful. He'll lead you to hell like a hog to a slaughter. I got, I tell you what, I hope we don't get these bad hogs up in this country, but they ain't very far away. But I just love those hog traps they got making nowadays. They're round, made out of strong steel, and they got this curved gate that goes up like this, about that wide. And I'll tell you what they do. They get that corn. They throw that corn outside. And they get them hogs coming in there. And, and you know, this is the stupidest thing you ever seen. You ever watch that deal? Yeah. Them hogs know. Now that corn didn't get there by itself. Yeah. <laughs> Something strange about this corn just showing up on the ground. Yeah. The other hog says, well, but it's there. We just will take it. Yeah. Yep, there's something wrong. With... <laughs> yeah. Well... You seen anybody around? They don't know they got a stupid camera on them. Yeah. <laughs> Watching every stupid move they make. On, Watching their flesh beat their better senses down. Yeah. And finally, well, you go first. All right. Yeah. Well, ain't nothing wrong with this. Yeah. Next week they come back and that stuff's just right inside the gateway. Right there. This is funny looking deal to me. And I don't know where this deal here is. This is odd. Oh, it didn't grow out of the ground, that little pen right there. I don't know either, but sure. I mean, there that corn is. That's pretty good stuff. Boy, I'll tell you what, that last week, we ate it last week and didn't hurt us. Well, you're right about that. Oh, they had that all up. Next week they come back and that corn's about six feet inside. Oh, this don't look right. Ain't just something about this don't look right. Well, yeah, but we ate it last week and it didn't bother us. And I watched this the other day. I mean, the wildest thing you ever seen. They got to where finally, you know, they put that corn around in the middle. There's two or three big old boars. Do you know what them boars led in with them? Listen to me. They led all the mama pigs and all the baby pigs in with them. And the old boy said, come on in, mama. Bring the kids. Let's go down and dress naked and drink beer and smoke dope. And ain't nothing when the devil going, hey, that's right, it ain't hurt nobody. You ain't hurt nobody. You just, you won't be a good libertarian. As long as you don't bother nobody with what you do. I'm going to tell you, a libertarian, bother somebody don't have nothing to do with. If God said don't do it, you don't do it. And, it, and I watched that thing. And them big old boy hogs there, and they just are slopping that corn up. And all of a sudden, that old boy hit that button on his phone. Boom! Them hogs went wild. Game over. Game over. <laughs> they went berserk. Rawr! Boom! They'd hit it. 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 Don't take something. They was corn getting scattered everywhere, and they wasn't interested in corn no more. Come on. Come on. The king of Sodom. King of Sodom. That old gate come down. Like you said, the show's over. So what's up next? 
Run, kids, run! Get out! Daddy, we can't. Mama, stand in front of the kids! Gotcha. Boom! Boom! Daddy, where can we run? Daddy, help us get away from here! Ain't no place to go. I'm going to tell you something. You bust hell wide open, it's going to be over for you. I want to tell you something. You can make fun of preacher preaching on hell all you want to, but you're making fun of Jesus Christ. Because he preached on hell more than he did heaven. I think God wants me. I'm not even a third away through this message, and I'm done right now. And I want the parents to come. Want every head bowed and every eye closed. I want you to do something with God this morning. Who are you serving? The King of Sodom or King of Salem? Who are you serving? Who's honestly are you serving today? Who's really your king? I want to ask you something this morning. Who is your king? I, I'm honest with you. I didn't even get started on the message. Who, who's going to be your king? People are already coming. You ought to come. The Holy Ghost dealt with you. You ought to come. You say, I want to be saved today. I don't want to go to slaughter pen. Won't you break out? You say, well, I would if my wife would. Your wife ain't going to stand with you at judgment. I'm sorry. I would if my husband would. Your husband ain't going to stand with you at judgment. It's going to be a personal decision. You know the greatest day of my life? When I said I ain't worrying about what nobody else thinks no more, I ain't going to hell over what nobody thinks, whether they like it or don't like it. I am going to trust Christ as my Savior. Some of you need to be saved today. You need to be saved. That's your problem. You need to be saved to make Jesus Christ your King. Your King. Would you come? It's all God's hands now. It's all God's hands now. Who is your King? Honest to goodness. All right, I'm going to ask you a question. Please don't, please don't lie to yourself. Lying to me, you can get by with it. I'll never know the difference. Don't lie to yourself. Could you say in an honest heart that according to my life, I didn't say you were sinless. I didn't say you didn't trip and fall. Every Christian does. What I'm talking about is who's truly your king of your heart? Who do you want to please? Who do you want to serve? You say, Reggie, this message is rough. I can't help it. It's what God told me to preach. I want to ask you a question. Now, what, hang on your hats. Listen to me real well right here. If Jesus Christ is honestly, you can say with a clear conscience, though you may stumble, though you may fall, though you may do even that which you thought you might ever do, but your heart is turned to your king. If Jesus Christ is your king, I want you to stand right now. And I want you to do that something Abraham said to do. Did you know what Abraham did? The Bible says that he raised his hands toward the most high God. And I'll tell you what I want you to do this morning. I want you to tell the devil, I don't want as much as a thread from you. I don't tell him. That's what Abraham said. I don't want nothing you got. Nothing you've got. I'm going to serve the Most High God. Did you know what Melchizedek come up after Abraham rejected uh, old uh, King of Sodom? You know what Melchizedek brought to him? Bread and wine. Symbols of the cross. The body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he was saying? I'm going to lift up my hand to the possessor, the most high God of heaven. What would I want to serve? A little tin pin king of a little old town that's going to get blown off the map anyway. You're on a, hey, the king of Sodom was a loser. Why would you want to serve a loser? Would you lift your hand up right now and say, God, Jesus Christ, by God's grace, I want you to be my king. That's my prayer this morning. I tell you, I want God to rule my mind. I want him to rule my tongue. I want him to rule my thoughts. I want him to rule my attitude. I want him to rule everything in my life. Because can I tell you something? If the Bible tells you and me anything, it tells us that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father this morning. Worship him right now. Would you worship him and say, God, you're my king. God, you're my 
monarchy, Jesus, I refuse the king of Sodom. I refuse him. And I want to turn my head and lift up my heart and my hands to the God of glory who made heaven and earth. Who's your king? Father in heaven this morning, I tell you, God, I, I want to thank you for several things. But, oh, God, I thank you so much for helping me in preaching today. God, it's not easy. It's hard. It's difficult. God, I want some peace, but I can't have peace with this world. God, I know the only peace I'll ever have is with you. Lord, I want peace with righteousness. I want peace with truth. Dear God in heaven, I pray for these this morning that have come. I pray, God, some holy, eternal decisions have been made today about who's going to be king. God, today I pray that all of us here at this church, they wouldn't be window dressing. God, it would be hard work of the Holy Ghost. God, I thank you so much for putting this in the Bible. I tell you, Lord, I appreciate it so much. God, you tell us the truth. We're going to serve one or the other. I'm glad, Lord, that you don't have a dually run kingdom. I'm glad you don't let the devil have 40 acres and you got 60. I'm glad, God, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I'm glad, God, that you're the possessor and the creator of all of the universe. You are the most high God. And Lord, today I pray that there be some work of the Holy Ghost done in our hearts and our lives today. That we would, Lord, tell the king of Sodom, get out of here. That we'd turn away from him and his enticements. And I pray God in heaven that we'll turn around and throw our hands up toward the cross. And throw our hands up to the true tabernacle in heaven toward the mercy seat toward the blood and God I pray that we'll be faithful steadfast unmovable servants of the Lord God I need help you know it and I'm asking you for it and I believe you'll give it to me I ask you to help these people I ask you oh God to help the daddy see clearly in this church. To see clearly. Oh Lord, when I think about these passages of scriptures. About where families will be divided over these issues, Lord, and it's the truth. God, help these men to love you more than they even love their wives. For Lord, how can we honestly, truly love our wives if we don't have you in our heart first? God, help these parents to love you more than they love their children, more than anything. God, I thank you so much that you're a God of truth and righteousness. I'm glad, Lord, to know the truth. I tell you, Lord, I'd rather have the truth Amen. and then anything. Lord, I pray for these people today. Bless them, Heavenly Father. Strengthen them. In Jesus' mighty name, we bow and pray. Amen. I want to say to you this morning, now listen. Lot lifted up his hand to the wrong king. I, I want you to get this. He was a saved man, the Bible says. But he went for the wrong king in his practical daily living. And it got him. We just did that in chapter 13. You'll see it in chapter 19. This principle in Genesis 14. Genesis is the seed book to all theological truth in the Bible. And God knows that you and I are going to be presented with, here, I, I, I'm going to do this. Here's what the king of Sodom did with Abraham. Watch this. He came up to him and he said, I'll give you the goods if you'll give me the persons. Yeah. Now you read your Bible, you'll find out this is what it said. Yeah. I'll give you the goods. You know what he's telling you? I'll give you a new car, boat, yeah. whatever you want. You just give me your kids. Yeah. Yep. This stuff is so serious, you can't hardly believe it. It is absolutely astounding to me when I read this and comprehend what's going on in the unseen spiritual world with our lives. Yep, yep. I beg of you, I pray in Jesus' name. Now listen, don't be, don't be mad at me. Do you get mad at the mailman when he leaves you a $1,500 bill? 
I'm not talking about he leaves you a bill. For, I'm talking about when he leaves you a bill to pay $1,500. You don't get to the mailman, do you? You go out there next day and meet him at the mailbox with a stick and say, sorry, rascal left a message in my mailbox. I'm going to beat you. Don't be mad at me. I ain't nothing but a mailman. Amen. But if you get mad at me, it ain't going to change me. Amen. I'm sorry. God be my helper. I, the fact of it is, I think it's going to get worse Amen. as I get older. Amen. I'll be honest with you. I feel like there's a surge of God's power going on in this church. And I'll tell you what's going to happen here. You, you, you better get on. You better get your feet in the stirrups. I'm telling you, God is doing something. And the best thing you do is get right with God. Get through and, say, and just say, God, I'm in. Amen. I'm in. I'm in. And say, Lord, where you lead, I follow. Amen. Brother Josh, this, this week, it's 12.05. Brother Josh gave me a little book this week, one of the sweetest things written by R.A. Torrey, and it said, The Secret of D.L. Moody's Power. And the first thing he said, well, he knew him personally, and he had watched what God had done with that man, and watched what God did in this nation with, the, with that man. And he said, here was this secret. Number one, he said, he was fully surrendered to God. Amen. Totally sold out to God, period. Nothing in front of God. Amen. Second, he said he was a man of prayer. Wow. Thirdly, he was a man that studied the Bible. Thirdly, he was a man that had a passion for souls. Fourthly, he had no interest in monetary advancement of his own life. Money didn't mean anything to him. He said, I knew the man. When I, I said to myself this week, Josh, reading that book, when we get there where D.L. Moody was, God will use us. He's not a respecter of persons. He's just waiting for us to get fully surrendered, to get over all the tricks and all the stupidity and the half-heartedness and let God work. Now, I'm going to tell you also, I, I, I don't believe in making prophecies, but sometimes you can put the microscope up and you can see it a little ways down the road. Let me tell you something further, and don't you hinder this. In fact, you ought to get in on it. God has done something special among the young people of this church. Apart from me, in spite of me, he's doing something. And you better pray with all your might that God does not allow that fire to go out that's in these kids. They're doing this stuff on their own. And I'll tell you, God, woe to the man who hinders them. Woe to the man who tells them to cool off. Because I expect that God is preparing some hearts for the future that you and I would have no earthly dream about. I love y'all. Let's sing. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Reign forth the royal diadem and crown. Heavenly Father, I tell you, Lord, I'm to the point where I realize I just don't know nothing except you're God. I'm not. Jesus died for me. And Lord, I don't know what to really to say other than I just worship you and I love you. And I want to thank you for your mercy. Because yeah. Lord, I tell you, if I look at myself, it's bad. Yeah. But Lord, if I look at Jesus, it's all right. And I pray that you'll fill these people's hearts with joy and peace in believing. God, let them know that if you've forgiven them, you have forgiven them. God, let them know that your mercy is new every morning. That, Lord, if they could have been sinless, they wouldn't have needed a Savior. But, oh, God, beyond that, beyond salvation, God, lead us into holy service. Lead us into commitment and dedication and devotion. And lead us away from this stupidity of this world. To the futileness of it, the stupidity of it, the nastiness of it. For God, thou art holy. Lord, I love you today. I thank you for having mercy on me. And I pray God right now something. If I've said anything that would hinder somebody from getting saved or growing in the Lord, that you'd strike it from the mind. Because I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. But I pray, Lord, what's been said is truth. 
that you'll never let them forget it. And Lord, I don't care. They may be out somewhere, Lord, some night. And they'll remember that God loves them and Jesus died for them. And they don't have to go to hell. And God, they can spit in the face of the king of Sodom and tell him, the Lord, that you don't really want nothing he's got. Yeah. And Lord, may they turn in their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, the king of Salem. And God, may they raise their hand to him and worship him and embrace him and serve him all the days of their life. Lord, I tell you, I bless your holy name. I tell you, I appreciate it. I, I thank you for helping me shut down when you told me to. I tell you, Lord, I appreciate it. I've got a problem there, Lord. Hard for me to do. But Lord, I pray, bless these people. Lord, I ask you, I ask you, Lord, to do a special work in this Daughters of the King Sunday. Lord, this thing's on my heart. And I'm asking God that the touch of Almighty God, Lord, that like Elijah lay there, and an angel came and touched him. God touched these girls' hearts in this church. Visit them with the Holy Spirit of God. In spite of everything this stinking stupid world tells them to be and act like, that God, they'll want to please you and serve you. Make them real women. God, I pray bless this effort. I pray for the camp meeting, God, that the Spirit of God will just fall upon this place. Lord, orchestrate things by thy divine mighty hand, your sovereignty in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll see you tonight. I'm